Okay, good morning and welcome to uh, Bridges of Belonging. This is our third conversation and uh, I'm so excited to once again be here and hosting this and really excited to share this morning with our panelists. So my name is Andrea Carey, I'm the Chief Inclusion Officer with Inclusion Incorporated and I want to begin with a territory acknowledgement. Um, I have the great fortune of living and um, being a guest here on Coast Salish Territory here in Victoria and um, the traditional nations of the Esquimalt and Songhees peoples have done such an amazing job um, of stewarding this land and keeping it safe and welcoming and beautiful, especially in these uh, times when we've been here kind of nonstop for the last few months and um, just being really grateful to be here. So, and I know many of you are joining from across the country. So just taking a moment today to acknowledge the territories that you're on and uh, the uh, traditions that we should observe in considering those territories and the work that's been done. Um, I just wanna also start by talking a little bit about protocol on Zoom. So um, we're asking everyone to mute and turn off their cameras so that we can really uh, experience our speakers and their stories. And as we get later in the conversation, we'll invite you to put comments in the chat box. And uh, if you would really like to uh, turn your camera on and speak your question, then you're certainly welcome to do that as well. So I'll invite that a little bit later on. And um, these sessions are being recorded. So uh, by staying on the call, you uh, will be, your name and uh, photo, if you choose to put it up, will be uh, recorded and put on YouTube later. I always like to begin these discussions with a little bit of a quote to kind of frame um, where we're at today and what we're doing. And so today I'm uh, sharing from Unfamed, Glennon Doyle, which I know both Diane and Devin are familiar with. And um, the section I chose to read from today is actually her, her section around racism, which has been such a powerful topic in our uh, media and our world and how we're all experiencing things right now. And so I just wanted to uh, take a moment to read a quote for you. I'm just muting a couple people. There we go. Um, so here we go. I know that I will later read this and see the racism in it that I cannot see right now. But I think of the words of Dr. Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Doing our best now is an active thing. And so is knowing better. We don't show up and then wait to magically know better. We show up and then when we are corrected, we keep working. We listen hard so we can know better next time. We seek out teachers so we can know better next time. We let burn our ideas about how good and well meaning we are so we can become better next time. Learning to know better is a commitment. We will only know better if we continue unbecoming. So I will commit to showing up with deep humility and doing the best I can. I will keep getting it wrong, which is the closest I can come to getting it right. When I am corrected, I will stay open and keep learning. Not because I want to be the wokest woke who ever woked, but because people's children are dying of racism and there's no such thing as other people's children. So with that, oh. yeah, I know that's, um, that's a big one to start off with, but it just felt so timely to uh, share that with this group and um, kind of sets the tone a little bit for some of the discussions I think are probably going to come up today. So um, I do just want to just take a moment to welcome and uh, introduce both Diane and Devin, um, both of whom I just hold in such high esteem and I'm so grateful to have you here today and to be able to share this journey with you. So um, Diane and I have known each other for many years, both as friends and she's been a huge part of my leadership journey and uh, trajectory of my career. And Devin and I only met in the last year and uh, quickly hit it off and uh, have become fast friends and uh, just really appreciate the work that both of you bring to the world. So Devin is a CBC uh, news reporter and um, is based in Toronto, worked for the CBC in Calgary and Saskatoon. He's a sports enthusiastic and passion, passionate advocate for reporting stories that share truths at the forefront and backrooms of our sports system. 
He helped break the story for CBC on the chronic sexual abuses by coaches in the sports system and has continued to pursue justice for athletes who are brave enough to share their stories. And I know right now you're in the thick of doing a lot of work around the racism stories and bringing sport and racism um, together in that intersection and talking about some of those brave stories. So thank you for that work, Devin. Thanks, Andrea. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you. Diane is a coach, speaker, and facilitator with a superpower for creating safe and inspiring environments that create unguarded conversations and transformational change. She's founded Inspired Results Group for leaders who are co-creating cultures, shaping conversations, and impacting lives and organizations around the world. Her company is redefining what leadership looks like over the next century. She's on a mission to end the era of, era of command and control and usher in an age of enlightenment and empower. She's a member of the faculty of Royal Roads University and teaches executive coaching to leaders across North America. So thank you both so much for being here. Um, we're going to begin by each of them just sharing a little bit more about themselves. So um, Devin, do you want to lead us off with that? Sure, I would love to. Um, it is so good to be here. Thank you for, for that great uh, opening, Andrea. Uh, Diane, it's good to see you and everybody else who's joining. Uh, to steal a part of, of, of that opening that you read from Glennon Doyle, I am showing up here with the deepest humi humility. I might say the wrong thing. I'm gonna try my best today. I'm gonna try and be as vulnerable as I can today. Uh, I'm a little afraid. I'll be, I'll be candid about that. We've talked about that. As a journalist, I'm somebody who has been programmed and has been taught that uh, we share other people's stories, we give platforms to other people, but we certainly don't talk about ourselves or our own experience, but I know that I have a platform. I think I've come to understand that maybe I have an, a, a small important voice in all of this, and so I had to be here today. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. Look, I grew up in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, on the west side of Saskatoon in a community called Dundonald. I went to high school in an inner city uh, high school. Uh, we were called the Bedford Road Redmond, if you can believe it, a name that uh, we pushed hard to get out of the school and was eventually pushed out of the school. But um, there have been so many circumstances uh, throughout my life where I've been pushed up against social injustice and uh, as a gay man, had to navigate my own journey in this world of, of growing up in Saskatoon and the sports world, being gay and understanding what that all meant. And so it's been a long journey. It's been a long and winding journey. Um, and it hasn't always been easy. Um, but I, I knew that, uh, that I, was, I was somebody that wanted to always try and, and do better once I knew better to, to talk about what Maya Angelou said. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of privilege throughout my life. And then I, I had to confront myself with being gay, wonder why throughout high school and throughout my late teens that I wasn't feeling like I was belonging. And I know we're gonna talk a lot about that today, but why don't I feel like I belong in these spaces was something that always came up. So I became a chameleon. I became really good at putting on the mask. Uh, I like to think of myself as a, as a circle that was always trying to fit into square spaces and could never fit in. So, um, you know, I had to, I had to navigate that and, and learn a lot about what I believe. My mom, I'll never forget the words she asked me in my early twenties. What do you know with certainty? What do you know to be true in your life? And I froze because I didn't really know what I knew in my heart with a lot of conviction. So ever since that moment, it's sort of been a journey to find out what I know, what I trust, what I believe intuitively, um, and that journey in the midst of a pandemic and in the midst of racial injustice uh, continues today. And, and just a final word uh, before we, we hear from Diane. Um, I, I have been so blessed in my experiences in life, despite it being difficult at times, through being a journalist and through every day talking to people that provide me with incredible perspective that has shaped and and helped me grow in ways I could have never understood when I entered the CBC world when I was 16 years old and have been doing this ever since. So the work continues. Uh, I was afraid, like I said, to do this, but I'm so damn glad I'm here with you all today. 
Thanks for that great opening, Devin. And um, you do have such a platform to share your voice and to help make other people's experiences safer and more welcoming as we go forward. So I'm grateful you're sharing your voice with us, but I'm grateful every day that you're sharing it in the work you do and bringing other people's voices to life. So thank you for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Diane, let's mm -hmm. bring you and uh, get you introduced to this group. I know. I'm so uncomfortable now because I just want to ask Devin a bunch of questions and that's really <laughs> where my comfort zone is. And so, yeah, letting it be about me for a while is um, very uncomfortable. So I'm going to ease into the discomfort because that's what we're all practicing right now. And I loved your question um, that you sent ahead, Andrea. It got me thinking. You asked, who are you? And right away I was like, oh my gosh, all the identities I hold in my life of, and mom and wife came up first and I have two teenagers and um, they teach me so much every single day. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I am a leadership coach. I'm an entrepreneur. I am currently embracing my leadership and really thinking a lot about that as I build my business, show up in the world, what kind of leader do I want to be? And I'm a sister, I'm a friend, I'm a daughter, um, I'm a cousin, I'm all kinds of things. And I think it's that, like, how do I belong in all of those places is what you've really got me thinking about. And so I'm looking forward to sharing that. Devin, as you were sharing, right away I noticed this, like, oh, well, you know, what hard things do I have to share? I've had such a privileged life. Um, and I know we can't you know, be, we can't limit our own stories, no comparative suffering here. Mm. I don't have to, you know, minimize my own experiences because I find yours so compelling and challenging. I, I've had experiences where I've been the only woman, the youngest person, felt like I had to prove myself, hustle for my worthiness a lot of my career. And it was that 40s, I always say, oh, when you get into your 40s, like freedom land because then you're like I don't really care what people think about me anymore <laughs> who the hell am I how do I want to step into that and that was my turning point era so now um I, yeah I feel like in my early 50s I'm like I I am stepping into this and I'm just going to be me and if I belong I have to belong to myself first and then I can belong elsewhere but it took me a while to figure that out. So, so that's where I'm sitting right now. I'm feeling very uncomfortable about my privilege and um, my blind spots around that. And I'm just really sitting with that discomfort. And like Devin said, I'm just going to show up imperfectly as myself today and see what unfolds. So thank you for creating the space, Andrea. Yeah, and I think, you know, in all of this, we're all on this learning journey and figuring out sort of how to navigate the many dynamic circumstances that have come at us the last few months and i said to devin the other day like we're at this unbelievable collision of intersectionalities where you know we have race and we have um sort of these celebrations around pride month and around indigenous history month and we've got um it's national accessibility week and we're in the middle of a pandemic mm. which no one knows how to navigate or what's coming next and it's just like there's so much coming at us and so how do we you know be true to who we are connect to sort of what grounds us our purpose our values and use those to guide us because plans have all gone out the window and continue yeah. to go out the window um so in uh, sort of both of your introductions, you know, you really express that vulnerability and sort of those journeys of belonging. And Diane, I thought you so poignantly said, you know, I got, I have to belong to myself first. So I'm actually going to flip back to Devin and say, ask him about, you know, sort of your journey in finding yourself, because I know that's something that you've kind of been wrestling with and figuring out as you navigate your journey. So do you want to kick us off with that? Yeah, it, Diane, it, it hit me in the in the heart when you said um, belonging to yourself and trusting yourself and knowing who you are because you 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 did send us that question about where where do we feel we belong? I don't think I belong anywhere, um, mm -hmm. but yet I think I feel I belong everywhere. So it's a weird thing, right? Because when you are at home with yourself, at least I've had glimpses of it recently. 
then then you're you're at home everywhere right but i can tell you i can remember early in all of this when when i hadn't come out when i hadn't come out publicly i was a, i was a, the sports editor of the university of saskatchewan newspaper at 18 years old and i was it, it, unbelievably having to pass the pride center to get to the to the newspaper office every single day and it was like my inevitable reality was playing out in front of me every day i had to walk by it but I can remember sort of every fiber of my being when I walked into a dressing room or when I interviewed coaches or when I was in the heteronormative space of sport, um, just completely feeling like I was abandoning everything that I was. And I felt it in every part of my being energetically. I felt it in the way I asked questions. I heard it in my voice. And what I think that did in turn to the people I was talking to all of those early years is it put them in that space as well. Hmm. But what was fascinating to me and what continues to be fascinating to me as I continue to do this work and, and show up in spaces and show up in front of the camera um, and microphone is that as soon as I started to sort of sink into everything that I was, I was allowing everybody else I was interviewing, I was allowing the audience, I was allowing everybody else to feel like they belonged and lean in a little bit closer. I had a producer when I was 22 years old and thought I was a hotshot reporter leading the CBC Calgary newscast, look at me and say, what the hell is that thing you do with your voice and your body? Because that's a shtick. And it was, I was putting up an armor every single day mm -hmm. so that if people didn't like me, it wasn't me they didn't like, it was that persona that I had created and I was protecting myself. So when you talk about belonging, when you talk about all these things, about feeling at home with yourself, about creating space for other people, as soon as we sink into everything that we are, everybody around us is able to come on that journey with you. It took a long time and continues to take me time to learn that and, and I'm now paying attention to the people and the places that sort of knock me from that. Why am I doing this? Why am mm. I changing my voice? Why am I taking it on the octave lower because I'm a sports report? Like all of those things. And now I know with certainty that all I could ever want for the people that come in contact with me is to create the same space that I know allies and supporters in my life have created for me to show up fully. That's the magic sauce, I think. And that becomes more clear in everything that I do. So that's, to me, that's belonging. I don't fit in anywhere, but I can fit in everywhere because I have that choice in every moment. Mm -hmm. mm, that's uh, beautiful, Devin. Thank you for that. Diane, in your journey and sort of in raising that piece, like tell us a little bit about how you got to the place where you felt like you belonged to yourself first so that you could create the spaces for others. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm going to build on what, what I'm hearing in Devin's story too, is that, you know, the difference between fitting in and belonging, mm. and I know I spent a lot of years trying to fit in. I was definitely socialized to fit in. Um, so lots of fitting in effort, uh, yeah, through my teens and 20s and 30s, I would say. Um, so that, well, <laughs> I think you know, I signed up for executive coach training thinking I was going to learn a bunch of skills and I was going to, I had coached in sport and synchronized swimming was my sport, Devin. That was my gig. So Love way back it. when there was an identity of athlete. Yeah. And I coached in Australia. So I always had this coach identity in me. And then I met a leadership coach in 2007. I was like, what? That's a thing? Leadership coaching? So I signed up for coaching thing. I'd learned some skills. And within the first few days, I'm like, holy shit, I got to learn about myself first in order to show up and coach others and that journey my one of my good friends calls it like oh you go into this program and it's soul exfoliating like they just get in there and like clear out all the junk so it was hard work it was uncomfortable work to really look at who i was uh, what are my values what were some of the limiting beliefs i was holding about myself and all of that good work so i think it's the the journey to belonging like you say Devin, belonging to yourself is the uncomfortable journey of knowing yourself and accepting mm -hmm. yourself and there's a like there's a great quote from Brene about your level 
of belonging is directly connected to your level of self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. So that self-acceptance journey, um, and yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of great books, so you can, you can learn at a cognitive level, but I do, I am a big believer in you need to um, work with a helping for, 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 uh, professional, get some support in that, uh, someone to ask you the hard questions, be seen and witnessed in that journey, um, speak all of your stuff out loud and, and find out you're still okay. Like you can bring all of that forward and see it and learn from it and then integrate who you really want to be, which is a very long answer to your question. Um, yeah, I'll stop talking there. You don't ever have to stop talking. Mm. <laughs> um, Devin, any kind of reflections on that before I move to next questions? Yeah, I mean, other than to just reinforce and, and reaffirm everything Diane said, I mean, um, so much of of the intersectionality like you talked about just coming to a head within three months of confinement uh watching uh, the exhausting and tragic scenes playing out in america every single day uh the beginning of pride month there's been a lot of reflection for me i've been a very busy person i've been running from a lot of who I am for a really long time. I'm on the road eight or nine months out of the year. I'm wondering what story I'm telling next, what flight I'm getting on next. So this, as, as tragic as all of this has been, um, has been probably one of the bigger blessings of my life to have to really sit with things and be still and really get clarity on who I am what's important to me, who's important to me, how to navigate all of this. And I think there's something really powerful about uh, the level of collective suffering and collective loss that we're all experiencing through this. I think there's power in that. And I think we're all paying attention in ways we could have never imagined. Um, and, and what an interesting thing it is to see that sort of coincide in parallel with having to just be still and having to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that was a really poignant way to put that. I, I mean, I often reflect back when I've heard you speak recently on your podcast and then today in terms of like, you know, you and I sat and had a glass of wine in December and talked about how crazy our travel schedules were. And we were, you know, kind of uh, talking about how, you know, it just felt like this kind of wild ride and it's like, then it comes to this crushing halt and yeah, you're faced with sort of navigating who you are rather than sort of what's next. It's, yeah. it's, it's such a common experience, I think, to, to run from our emotions uh, with busy and with doing. And this, I, I love what you said, Devin, it's like it's, it's forced us, caused us, given us the opportunity to sit with ourselves. And um, that's not always fun times. It hasn't been. It really hasn't been. There have been some really dark times because, listen, I have, I have lived a life based on performance, based on being what people expect me to be in front of a camera and in front of a microphone. I have conditioned myself to be a perfectionist, to make up for uh, what I believe to be flaws for being a gay man. So if I was perfect at everything, that would undo this fatal flaw that I could never undo in the eyes of so many people in society. And so who am I when the bright lights of the television go off and when I'm not on the runway and I'm not in the arena and I'm not getting validation of tweets and clicks and likes because I'm on to the next adventure? Who am I in the dark corner of my room two months into quarantine? That's a question I've never had to really sit with myself before and, and answer. And, and I've begun that and, and continue to learn and, and continue to sort of confront all those things and sit with feelings and feel it all, right? So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So brave. Yeah, absolutely, feeling it all. So Diane, so much of your work has been about kind of meeting people where they're at, learning about what's going on for them and how they're struggling or thriving in their various places and spaces and supporting their next journey. So. Um, tell us a little bit about sort of how belonging and inclusion and um, 
just meeting people where they're at has kind of played out for you and how you facilitate those uh, hard conversations, those opportunities to create safety and allow people to show up however they need to show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the, I think the idea of being seen and sending signals, either with, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, because sometimes we can be in a conversation and not feel seen. I don't know if any of you have had those conversations. Um, really acknowledging who's in front of you, um, talking less, listening more, I think is a skill we can all cultivate, which is what makes this forum more uncomfortable for me. <laughs> the, uh, in groups, what I've really learned, these really simple things like facilitating a, a group conversation or a learning experience, that creating that safety, so, so creating, co-creating the culture that we're gonna operate in as a group and being transparent about that so that people don't have to spend the morning or the day trying to figure out what's what's appropriate, what's acceptable um, in terms of how, I'm, how we're showing up. Like just name it, be transparent about it. And then everybody, you can just see the group relax. Like, oh, okay, that's how we're gonna be with one another. Cool, now I know what to expect. Now I know how to show up. So that, I think that instantly creates safety and supports people. And, and, you know, what Devin was talking about in terms of modeling what you want to create for others. So if you want people to feel safe and seen and sharing their true selves, then I need to show up and be my true self, be vulnerable, talk about whatever um, I'm feeling in that moment and just be me and trust that being me is enough. I don't have to put on a show or put on my expertise because I really don't feel I have any expertise in anything. Uh, so that's, and that's okay. I can just show up that way. Um, so I think the modeling thing is so essential and then being transparent about what container we're creating helps people feel at ease and then they can show up and be seen. Your statement around sort of co-creating the culture of how people are going to work together, I feel like right now our society needs that. We need to figure out how we're going to co-create how we all move forward in this kind of wild world of ours right now together because we're, you know, there's just mm -hmm. so many things coming at us and so many challenging problems and so many disparities and it's just such an opportunity to go, okay, how do we, you know, really figure out what we want to do together and move forward together. It would just be this beautiful opportunity to do that. Yeah, yes. And it's uncomfortable because there's a lot of unknowns in co-creation. But I think, you know, we're seeing that you know, the authoritarian leadership model isn't really serving the world right now. Some places, yes, some no. Um, so how can we do that differently? Yeah. And um, Devin, like with your work around telling stories and having people kind of share some of the most horrific things that can really happen in people's lives and you're, you know, setting up these spaces and places for them to tell those stories and kind of bear witness to those stories and elevate the conversation so that we're you know, it's bigger than the one person, but it's about the one person at the same time. So tell us a little bit about sort of your journey through that. It, yeah, and journey is, is the right word for it because I think my being gay and having to navigate what that meant in the world, specifically the sports world that I was in, actually has served me in ways that I could have never imagined because in those early days of trying to understand who I was and what I wanted to be and what my voice was, I became a master bullshitter at fitting into all spaces at all times. So I, I had the ability to, to walk into rooms, to walk into spaces, not only in the sports world, but in everything that I was doing and, and kind of have a spidey sense of what, how people were talking, how they were holding their bodies, what what were we doing in these spaces and how could i make sure that 
you know, I, I didn't want to be seen. I didn't want to be noticed, but I was screaming to be noticed. Right. right? So I, I was conflicted with all those things. So it was a real mind trip every single day of trying to navigate how I fit into every space that I walked into. So, and I became really good at it. So now when I go into all of these spaces and, and you're right, I've talked to people on the worst days of their lives. I've talked to people of every race, every ethnicity, every sexual orientation, every part of this country. And you have to get people to trust you with their deepest, darkest hurts in a really short amount of time. It's something I don't take lightly. lightly. It's, a, it's a great responsibility. I never really wanted to do any of what I continue to do to this day. But I think it's become more clear to me than ever how important it is as journalists that we create the most healthy, inclusive, safe space to the people and their story, to the stories we're sharing. And if we're not committed to that in the most authentic ways uh, imaginable, then we need to get out of this, this profession. I'm seeing horrible journalism. I don't want to get on a, on a pedestal, but I'm seeing horrible journalism being done right now that is dehumanizing people, that's stripping them of their truth and their experience. And as somebody that has had that happen to me, I know the pain of that and I know the cost of that. And so um, to me, that's what this has always been about is in everything that I do, remembering the humanity that exists within all of us. And we are capable of doing really horrific things to varying degrees when we forget about the humanity that exists within all of us. So it is and continues to be a great honor to me when I have people, including this morning, people trusting me with their most, uh, their deepest pain. Um, and I've carried a lot of that and continue to carry a lot of that. Um, but it's important to me because I feel like because of my own personal experience, I have a different perspective and a different voice in an industry that has had for too long a singular voice and a singular way of stories being told. So I think everything that I've been through in my life has, has in a lot of ways prepared me to be um, the storyteller that I would want to be. So that's, that's my long way of answering how I try and go about my work every single day. Yeah, I mean, coming back to the humanity is just such a massive piece. And, you know, you talk about your industry being sort of one way, but there's so many industries that are and continue to be and people have not figured out how to um, bring in and others, lift them, elevate the conversation, elevate the voices so that we get um, the diversity that we need in order to be better leaders, to make better decisions, to create better systems. And, you know, the sports system is still predominantly sort of one, one thing, and I'm not going to start categorizing it because I'm sure probably everyone on the call knows exactly what I'm talking about. It was, it was <laughs> on the tip of your tongue. Yeah. I heard it. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, as all of us have gone through our journeys, you know, we talk about sort of that fitting in versus belonging piece. And, you know, Devin, you just described how you, you know, worked to fit in. And then you were able to kind of pivot that to um, facilitate others feeling like they belonged, even though I'm sure in many of those situations, you didn't feel belonging yourself, but you facilitated it for others. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there was a time uh, when I thought that I knew the story, I thought I knew best, I had a lot of ego, and I could never humble myself to being open about I don't know what I'm about to ask you. And I, and I pretended that I was the expert on all things. And now when I go into these really difficult conversations, which I'm sure people who are listening are having with their families. I had a tough conversation with my sister in Saskatoon yesterday about race. Mm -hmm. And being able to say, I don't know, serves us so well. It just opens up so much. And so when I go into these really heavy conversations, it's the first thing I say to the people I talk to. I say, I might say the wrong thing today, and I apologize, and I want to learn from you. So tell me how I can be better. And right in that moment, we're on a different 
we're on a different mm -hmm. plane immediately, you know, mm -hmm. but that takes humility and vulnerability. It does. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And openness as well. Um, just in terms of like where it may all go and that it's going to be a bit of a journey together to navigate that. Um, Diane, you, you know, that's a lot of the crux of your work as well. And, um, probably some of your journey. So do you want to kind of weigh in on that? Oh, I'm just bringing Devin to all of my future workshops to tell his story. <laughs> yeah, because he's got this nail, this whole vulnerability thing and, and being willing to get uncomfortable and be yourself and start from that place rather than that I know or I'm an expert place. That That's the shift I'm hoping to create in the world. So thank you for modeling that. And I'll let you know what the schedule looks like. It's all virtual. Devin, you can show up at all of them. No problem. <laughs> I'm there. I'm there. Uh, I'm so, yeah. You know, and I'm maybe going to come back to your question, Andrea, but what Devin got me thinking about is uh, the power of creating space to share stories is a way to create belonging. It is a way to create inclusion. And um, often we're, we think we have to come in and know it all or, or share our story or our version of truth in order to lead. Or, and I think we just have to flip that paradigm around and just create the space for conversations. And I, I wrestled with this yesterday because I was feeling so uncomfortable and just so heavy and just, just so uncomfortable with my own ignorance, that kind of stuff. And I had a workshop planned. We had an agenda. And I decided to just take the first half hour of the planned agenda and invite the group to have conversations about how, what they're noticing about their privilege and how it's showing up. And I could almost see on the leader's face, like, what's she doing? Where are we going? What's happening right now? This is not what we planned. And I did it anyway. It was risky. And, and they, I, you know, it was all on Zoom. So they went into their virtual rooms, came back in. And what really struck me was, you know, colleagues saying, wow, like I heard a perspective from this person that I, you know, a mixed race immigrant sharing her story. And they were like, wow, I had no idea. So it just taught me, if you just create the space for these messy, imperfect conversations, people share their stories, we learn, we, we learn so much. And we just have to get out of our own perspective right now and create the space to learn about other perspectives. And that we can all do that. We can all do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I struggled so much yesterday with sort of the blackout uh, trend on social mm. media. And I posted about this later in the day because I, um, as I was saying to you earlier, Diane, like I sat down to write a blog that I knew I wanted to write. I'd started it the day before and I just was like sitting with sort of this piece about blackout and I was like, I get it. Like I get why people are doing it, but I fear that they're not actually appreciating that that's a step and then they need to go on to learn more and do more and actually take an action out of that. And so it's like, oh, I put up a black picture on my profile, I'm good. And it's like, no, like we all have such mm. deep responsibility to, you know, understand the issue or take the time to start to learn about the issue and the topic and, you know, the background and the history and how do we facilitate that happening and learning about people's stories so that we can co-create a better way forward. Mm -hmm performative activism at its finest Ooh. in the same way that we see rainbow flags go up at the beginning of june every year we see corporate slogans change um, that is what my story is about today we see pro athletes we see athletes uh, we see leagues everybody racing to the front of the line to say words that are incomplete contradiction to their actions and their checkered history on race relations. And so it's easy to be brave when everyone else is brave, but who's brave when no one else is being brave? And isn't that what we are running up against right now and something that I'm reflecting on and remembering uh, the Stonewall riots and remembering where the, the movement for LGBTQ issues all began. And, uh, you know, when you start to piece this all together, it isn't as complicated and daunting and scary as we want to pretend it to be. It's actually quite mm -hmm. simple. Um, and so um, that's what that's what's sticking with me today. And I'm trying to be uh, I'm trying to be better and not just post black squares on Instagram. 
performative activism. I like that. Um, I, I actually hadn't heard that term before, but that's uh, a, la a label. I like the label of it. Yeah, some are worthy of Oscar performances without ever having done a thing. Yeah, and that was part of what I was struggling with yesterday and in a lot of the statements that are coming out where, you know, you look at, you know, whether it may be the name of a team or the logo, and yet here they're posting this, uh, you know, long diatribe about how, you know, racism is evil and they're anti-racism. And it's like, well, yeah, except you've had a racist name and a racist logo forever and you haven't done anything to change that. So um, the hypocrisy of all of it really was one of the pieces I was struggling with. So I'll look forward to your story. Coming, coming to a computer screen or iPhone near you. <laughs> <laughs> I think the national needs to pick that one up. Let's hope. Um, so tell us a little bit about um, what advice you'd have for leaders that are seeking to create cultures of belonging within the work that they do. I mean, you've each spoken sort of about your individual journeys, you've talked a little bit about your work, but what's, what are some of those tangible pieces that you would um, prescribe if we want to make some changes in how our cultures operate? You go, Diane. I want to listen mm. to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know where this came from, but I've got in my head this idea of we need to acknowledge, learn, and then do, to your point about yesterday. So I think for leaders, like, we have to acknowledge within ourselves and then acknowledge what's going on in our organizations. So, so that, and that's the first step, and that's uncomfortable uh, and vulnerable, and that's good. And then learn, like, how can we create more spaces to learn from each other to learn about just the bigger dialogue going on out there and just like someone said yesterday i don't know how to have these conversations at work and then boom we had the conversation at work so just have the conversations at work and let go of feeling like you have to have all the answers or know how to do it perfectly just have the conversations um, and then some of those tangible things i think are about um that I want to talk about that co-creating culture like every meeting i would start every meeting like how are we going to show up with one another what what's what's the way we're going to navigate um and when you know creating maybe some safety around you know if you have i remember this consultant came into a team i was working on that um, he, he just gave us this code like when you put your left hand up that means you have something you want to say that's a little bit uncomfortable but it flags for everybody, okay, this is a little uncomfortable, but I'm going to do it anyway. So how can you just normalize having uncomfortable conversations or giving people the space to speak their truth um, are just a couple of ideas that are on the top of my head. Love that. Kevin, what have you got? What have you got? Well, I, listen, I, this is just my personal belief, but I, I think we need to completely re burn down the ideas we have of what it means to be a leader. I think when we think about, I think about when we think about leadership, we think about words like dominate, mm -hmm. law and order, um, control. It's still through a single perspective. And until we redefine what it means to be a leader, I don't know if we're going to come up with better ways to be leaders. Um, and that's going to take a lot of work. That's going to take a lot of collective uncomfortability. But I think we, I think we need to surrender to the idea that what we've defined as being brave and courageous and, and, and being a leader and suck it up and win at all costs. Winning at all costs hasn't got us in, in good places. Winning at all costs allow coaches to abuse athletes. Uh, dominating has allowed people an abuse of power. Leadership as we know it today, from my perspective, has led to a lot of injustices and abuses of power. And until we're willing to acknowledge that and until we're willing to, to, to sink into a new idea, a new wave of what it means to be a leader, I don't know how far we're going to get. So. I, I agree. I think we absolutely need to, to create safe spaces. It's been a fascinating thing every single day to be in a corporate national broadcaster newsroom trying to push people um, of, a, of a singular voice every single day to consider other things. And what does it mean to be a leader in that space? When you know better, you do better. But how can you know better when 
there's nobody to teach you how to know better. Um, so there's, to me, there's a lot that, that needs to happen in terms of what it means to be a leader. And in my trying to be a leader in the small spaces of my life, there is a beautiful relief and surrender that comes to realizing that to be a leader, I actually don't have to do much. I can actually rely on everyone else around me and, and then my job becomes easy. And if you can mm -hmm. think about it, leadership that way and just allowing everybody to step in and step forward together, that sounds a lot easier to me. I think that sounds like the type of leader I'd like to be. Um, so this, this idea of being the keeper of all knowledge and, and all power, it ain't working. Nope. Yeah, I was thinking the other day that uh, in defining leaders, we almost need like feminism to be one of the key defining characteristics because it's uh, just seems like that keeps getting missed in terms of how we take care of each other and uh, support each other and create a better collective way forward. Yeah, Wade Davis uh, is a former NFL player, African-American. Uh, came out as a gay man after his NFL career retired, is now a professor of feminist studies in Chicago. Him and I have many, many, many deep mm. conversations. And he said, until we're all feminists, we're screwed. Yeah, exactly. Mm. <laughs> um, so. I'm going to invite folks to, if you've got a question, to either put it in the chat box or uh, let us know that you'd like to use your voice to articulate that. Um, and uh, in, while we're waiting for those to come through, I'll ask a next question. What does uh, trust mean to each of you in your belonging journeys? I think you have to trust yourself first. Um, it, like, I, I see a lot where we want, and I get it, we want trust to exist outside of us, or we have to trust somebody before we'll show ourselves fully. And I get that. And what I'm really playing with is if I, you know, park the conditional trust and instead trust myself and trust, like hold the other person capable too, and then just show up as me, then the trust can happen. But yeah, if we just are in protective mode until we feel super safe and then we'll be seen and then trust can happen, to, we'll just stay stuck forever and disconnected forever. Copy and paste, a hundred percent. Cause there have, so much of my life I haven't trusted myself. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what, I, what, what my values were. I didn't know what my intuition meant. Um, there was nothing about who I was or the way I lived my life that I trusted. Um, so I don't have much to add. It's, it, to me, it comes down to that. That is the only, that at the end of the day, it is ourselves that we can that we can only trust right and and if we goes back to what my mom said she was right sometimes she's good i, can, yeah. I should i should listen to my mom more <laughs> she'll like that um it takes me a little bit of time mom but i get there um trusting yourself comes back to what do you know for certainty and mm -hmm. if you can build a foundation of of trusting your core values in all that you are you know it, what's the great poem, uh, If by Rudyard Kipling, if you can keep your head when all those about you are losing theirs, right? Mm -hmm. That, that, that's it. That's the trust I think we need to seek. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, what about psychological safety? How does that play in? You know, Devin, you've talked about sort of how you create that as you're going into interviews and having some of those hard conversations. Diane, I know you do this as well. So, like, what are some of the pieces that you intentionally do to allow that to show up so that people know that it's a space they can feel comfortable in? You go first, Devin. Oof. Um... I struggle with that because I'm a highly insecure person. I'm an anxious person. Um, I'm pretty good at pushing through it and faking it. And I've had to fake it in a lot of times in my life. Um, but I've always said I probably picked the worst profession in the world to be an insecure, anxious person. <laughs> because when the bright lights of the camera um, 
are on you, you better, <laughs> you better be ready to stare down and deliver with um, steely-eyed precision. Um, and maybe that's what it is for me. Maybe it's understanding my own fragility and my own shortcomings and my own fears and my own insecurities that makes me understand that whenever I'm talking to somebody on the record or putting a microphone in front of their face, um, I can understand every single time I do that over all these years, insecure and anxious and scared somebody might be. Um, and, and some people might see this as hocus pocus. I don't, you know, I have my crystals, I have my incense, I have my cleansing of energy, but I believe in that energetic frequency that you can bring into spaces you go. And I am trying more than ever to be cognizant of the energy I carry through the tone of my voice, through my body. I think we learn a lot by the way people show uh, how their body moves when they're within our presence. So I'm always paying attention to those things and always making sure that I'm very aware of how I'm carrying myself um, and the energetic field in which I'm creating, knowing everything that I am and what I would want to be for that other person. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Diane. Mm -hmm. I just, I love that answer because we are such energetic beings and we pick up on that. And I think that's what I'm missing right now is it, it I mean, it can happen through these virtual spaces and it's, it's like, it takes a little more effort to connect on that energetic level, but I'm, I'm kind of reframing my belief around that. Um, but here's the other thing which feels risky to say, but I, that means I should say it. I also... I believe in psychological safety. I love Amy Edmondson's work and I, all those obvious things, you know, about not bullying people in the workplace, all that, all that obvious behavior. We absolutely need to create safe spaces for people to come to work. And I also sense that people are waiting to be vulnerable or be seen. They want it to be safe and comfortable. And my challenge is it might not if you wait for comfort, you'll wait forever. Like step into the discomfort. Don't use safety as your escape hatch for avoiding the vulnerability, I guess is the way to say that. Yeah, you can be vulnerable in, it is uncomfortable. So if you're holding out for safety and comfort, you'll wait forever. Just have a go, see what happens. Cause you can shift the energy to Devin's point when you speak your truth, when you show up vulnerable, energetically, something shifts, and that's when safety can be created. I like to, I like to think about it when I, when I walk up to somebody as a flower and a tight bud, and that my goal is to see this person blossom in front of me. That's the, that's oh. the imagery. That's the imagery that I think of in every interview I do, that I can feel that, but I know how beautiful they are inside and that I want to create that space for them to just bloom because I know what it's like to be wound up so tight. So that's what I imagine. And it's actually happened so many times where there's like an aha moment of like, ah, oh, I see, I see everything that you are now. Um, so that's, that's how I imagine it. Wow, that's a beautiful metaphor. <laughs> Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you for that gift. I'm sure everyone uh, that's watching this is uh, just kind of feeling that and going, okay, how do I how do I do that? And how do I ensure that people have that opportunity to just shine? Well, and if that was the new leadership mission it was to help everyone blossom and show their full beauty in the world, like that's the new definition of leadership right there. Okay, we're done. <laughs> yeah, we've solved it. We've solved it. <laughs> well, mic drop. Yeah. Um, so what question did I not ask either of you today or area that you wanted to delve into that we haven't? So I don't have a question, but I do have something that I was noticing and that I'm thinking a lot about is like, how do we like I think about this for my teenagers because <laughs> of course we always want our kids to like not have to go through all the hard struggles we did which is not realistic and how could we create 
belonging and that self-acceptance sooner for youth is something I'm thinking a lot about lately. And my daughter, you know, she's so, I just um, admire her sense of self. And what I've really hoped is that, you know, high school wouldn't take, kick that out of her, basically. You know, who knows what that will be. Um, but I think like as kids, like we innately are who we are. And, and then all these systems and society kind of beats that out of us, which is a terrible thing to say. But how can we help kids accept themselves sooner is something I'm leaving this conversation thinking about. So poignant because my sister and I had this exact conversation yesterday. I have three nieces in Saskatoon um, whom I want to grow up believing they can be whoever they want to be, that they can be strong women, that they can marry and love whoever they want to love, that they can be a voice for the voiceless, that they can be the ones to find within themselves what so many of us, including myself, haven't been able to do that call to speak when in the pit of our stomach, we know it isn't right and we need to say something, but we don't be, for whatever reason, maybe because we don't want to make people uncomfortable. How do we create that space for these young, brilliant people who are following us? And, and, and that then becomes the new norm. That mm -hmm. is what the new bar is. And my sister and I had a very candid conversation. What age do you start to have the conversations about LGBTQ issues, about race relations, um, all of these things? Listen, as somebody that grew up in a house in Saskatoon that, that only knew uh, what gay or every derogatory term around that was through negative connotation and through sport negative connotation, I grew up not understanding that I could be a successful gay man because there was not one image of representation in my life about what that meant. I don't fault my parents for that because you don't know what you don't know. But now that we do know, how can we say to these young people, it's okay to love whoever you want to love. And my oldest niece says, you know what, uncle? I think you're going to marry a man, she says to me out of the blue and that's and that is going to be okay and so you, you have three women now that are going to grow up with that understanding that that's just normal well i didn't have that and i hated myself a long time for that so for the people listening and and maybe for you diane and andrea have those tough conversations young people have more capacity than we give them credit for allow our young people to surp surprise us Let's not protect them thinking we're doing what's right. Allow them to surprise us and, and you'd be surprised, I think. True that. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, you know, to your point, Devin, like it's the norms have changed and continue to change. And so how do we open up those conversations early and intentionally so that we create the spaces for our children and future leaders to appreciate the differences and celebrate how we can all show up in the world? Um, on that note, we have run out of time, as happens wow. every week. <laughs> so I just want to thank Diane and Devin so much. Um, I've been so looking forward to this conversation. You are both such incredible people in my lives, and I value and appreciate uh, the relationship that I have with each of you, and I knew you'd bring such a rich dialogue. So I want to thank you for being here and for showing up so vulnerably and uh, sharing that with others. Thank you for the space, Andrea, to just be in the conversation. And Devin, it was so great to meet you here. Yeah, so, such a pleasure, such an honor. I'm, I'm grateful. I'm so grateful uh, for both of you. Um, I'm glad I did this. Like I told you, but when we were preparing, I woke up, I was so afraid. I was finding ways to get out of this. But um, if we want to step in the arena and be bloodied and marred and get into it, um, we got to show up. So mm -hmm. I'm showing up. And thank you for allowing me to. 
Absolutely. We have to show up. And uh, I thank both of you again. And I just want to, um, you know, recognize that you've given your time today to share these stories. And I think that it's, you know, really beneficial. And we'll be sharing this recording out afterwards on um, my website, inclusionincorporated.com. So others can share it forward as well and learn from this great discussion. Um, and I also just want to wrap up by sharing our guests next week are Karen O'Neill, who's the CEO of the Canadian Paralympic Committee, and Tim Adams, who's the Executive Director of Free Footy Society. One of the joys of putting this together is, I call it kind of curating the guests and figuring out who's going to have really interesting conversations. And Diane and Devin, you provided a really excellent conversation today, and I'm just so grateful. And um, I just want to wish everyone a really great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and spend time kind of reflecting on what you need to be okay right now because there's an awful lot going on. Thanks, Andrea. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Bye. Bye, everyone. Take care. <laughs>